So I'll start by uh, summarizing a bit the paleo context, which, which essentially means uh, giving you some indication of what type of paleo climate change I'm interested in and how, which, which uh, part of the, the, the last few million years we are interested in. Uh, I'll give a quick summary of the multiple state dynamics and that's essentially a bit of a repeat of what uh, uh, Brian did uh, yesterday. Then we'll get into the, the subject, which is what transition multiple between multiple states that we have and their dynamics is interesting to interpret DO events, which are dense car, dense gar, Oshger events. I'm, I'm going to define all of those terms in a minute. Then we'll switch to glacial interglacial cycle. I'll talk a bit about stochastic resonance and how stochastic resonance and the use of multiple state can be used to interpret uh, glacial interglacial cycle. And then there, there may be a bonus track if, uh, if I'm not too late. So uh, paleoclimate context. Uh, as uh, Brian mentioned yesterday, if we look at the Earth climate history over the last four billion years, Earth has been going through very, very different states, but we do have some indication of what were those states with some, some interesting uh, information, uh, at least over the last few million, years, few hundred million years. So that panel shows uh, what's called the neoprotozoic, protozoic, actually there's a spelling mistake, uh, snowball Earth. So we think that at maybe five, 700 million years ago, Earth went into a, a state where most of the planet was covered with ice uh, or land ice or uh, sea ice. Uh, perhaps there were some openings in there and there are plenty of questions uh, about what were exactly those openings because life made it through. So there was, there was some place where life could, could survive. So there's plenty of interesting questions, but the, 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 there's pretty certain evidence that the Earth climate was very, very cold and nearly entirely covered with sea ice. Uh, closer to us, there was a state like the Cretaceous where there wasn't any ice at all. Uh, so n probably no ice at the poles no ice uh, Antarctic, in the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, there are some indication that the equator to pole temperature gradient was weaker than it is now. It's very much subject to, to debate, uh, but clearly the, the climate was very different. The deep ocean was probably way warmer than it is now. So nowadays the, the deep ocean is uh, just a few degrees, three, four degrees on average. Uh, maybe it was 10 degrees, so it's a huge change, and that's an indication of where the water were formed. Well, they, they are formed usually in the coldest place at the pole, so the pole were probably warm. Uh, and obviously we have the present day climate, which has a bit of ice, but we live in a place where we are not entirely covered with ice. So we went through those three states. Oh, by the way, do you know how also we know that uh, uh, there weren't any uh, sea ice at the poles? Alligators, yes. Ta da! <laughs> yeah, so apparently there were alligators there and uh, palm trees. And if, if we think that those alligators and palm trees are as they, <coughs> they are their analogs nowadays, they can't survive if it's freezing. So clearly it wasn't freezing at that point. At any time in the year it was freezing. That's also subject to a lot of controversy. Uh, but we'll just take it for for granted. So Earth climate went through very different states and perhaps it was driven by a uh, change in CO2, perhaps it was driven by change in the con continental configurations, uh, perhaps it was driven by the fact that Earth is endowed with multiple states. That's one, one option. If we get on a way shorter time scale, which is still uh, a million year or half a million year, we have the glacial interglacial cycle. So that's, that's a plot of temperature at uh, the top of the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, 
that's obviously a proxy. There, there isn't a, a, a thermometer there. Uh, there's, there's a proxy that we think is measuring the temperature at the top of the ice sheet. And what you can see is that over Antarctica, there have been oscillations quite regular every about 100,000 years with uh, changes in temperature of about 10 degrees Celsius. So it's a big change. And in fact, we have plenty of evidence that those oscillations are associated with large global scale change in climate. So in the North Atlantic, uh, well, in the Northern Hemisphere, there were ice sheets over Canada and part of the US. There was an ice sheet over the Scandinavian countries, maybe going down all the way to the British Islands. Uh, the global mean temperature was probably a few degrees colder than it is now. Uh, PCO2 was 100 ppm uh, lower than it is before uh, um, pre-industrial times. Uh, so massive changes. And the leading order hypothesis for why those oscillations happened uh, is that uh, they are driven by the Milankovitch cycles. So the Milankovitch cycles are those oscillations of the orbital parameters of the planet. So we are talking about obliquity, which some of you are studying uh, uh, during the, the lab session, but also the precession. When is it that summer happens on the trajectory of the planet around the sun? Is it happening when the sun is far away or uh, closer to the, uh, well, sorry, the planet is far away or closer to the sun? And finally, the, the eccentricity, which is a mother measure of how much of the trajectory around the sun is a circle or is an ellipse. We'll come back to that late uh, in a minute. And then if you zoom on that period, what you find is that time series, which now is taken at the Greenland, on top of the Greenland ice sheet, uh, you, you clearly notice that uh, there's way more noise in that first part than in the other. And it, it's just a, a sampling issue. The further back, back you go in time, the harder it is to capture the high frequency variability. But there's oh, no reason to believe that the same variability wasn't happening in all the other uh, glacial states. So, during, so that's, during the glacial state, there is a lot of variability, at least over uh, Greenland, and it has time scale of million years, mi uh, thousands of years. And you will notice that those oscillations, they go almost back and forth between the climate, the cold state, and, and the interglacial state, which we are living now. So it's almost three quarters of the way out of the glacial into a, a warm world. So they are very large, but they are probably mostly limited to the North Atlantic. So they are no longer global. Those are clearly of global scale. Those are probably more regional, at least in the sense of hemispheric scale. Uh, although there is some signal associated to that uh, in other parts of the world. And uh, so I, I'm just repeating this one, the last 100,000 uh, years. If you zoom in and even further zoom in on just maybe uh, one or two of those oscillations, what you see is, uh, are called the DUO event, so dense, dense gar Oshgar events, which have a very, very characteristic shape. Uh, so sorry, now, time is going uh, this way. So that corresponds to an abrupt warming, a somewhat slow cooling, sometimes abrupt cooling, and then a cold phase. So they all have that very characteristic shape of uh, the abrupt warming, slow cooling, which you find uh, in almost, if you zoom in on each of those events, you can, you can spot that, that characteristic. So the interest of why am I pointing that out is that some of those transitions between a cold state and a warm state happens in decades. So they are extremely fast. Uh, obviously, they are much faster than the, the characteristic, characteristic time scale of the oscillations themselves. And a recurring topic in, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, those climate change of the past, those abrupt, is how do we get those fast timescales? And that's where the multiple states 
could be a very useful framework to think about uh, those fast time scale transition between states. So here I'm just giving you an example of a, a, a multiple, multiple equilibrium problem. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever done kayaking. If you've done, you know that that, that can happen. And you don't want to be there, but it's very stable. And obviously, that guy is very nice. And uh, I, I mean, that hand looks like it's not moving anymore, but uh, <laughs> it's going to pull him out. So clearly, do, you also know that that state is stable, right? You can stay there as long as you, you don't mess around too much. This, so that's a stable state. That's a very stable state. And it may be a dead state, you know, an infinitely stable state. Uh, I'll just give you an example of why those multiple states can be useful, because obviously going from there to there is very fast. It's very easy, and you don't need to push a lot to get there, right? So if you think of uh, flipping around, you don't need to have a force to pull you down all the way back with your head under the water to get there. You just need to go over some threshold, and gravity is going to do the rest, and uh, uh, buoyancy, whatever and you're going to finish there. So one, one characteristic of that, that problem is that when you drive a system from one stable state to the other, you don't need to have a forcing that drags all the system all across from one state to the other. You just need to pass over a threshold. And then the natural properties of the, the intrinsic properties of the system will carry you down to the next potential. So effectively, what you need to do for that ball to go there is just to move it here. The intrinsic property of the system will get it there. And that's a very firm fundamental difference between a system which has multiple states and maybe one which wouldn't have that, where you would need air forcing to drive the system from one state to another and maybe keep that forcing to stay there, while here, you, the system is using the intrinsic properties of, due to the nonlinearity. And uh, this is just an example to show the abruptness of it. Uh, I mean, but it, essentially, it's giving you the same message as here. So by using those multiple states, we can, one, address a question of uh, how do you relate the changes to the forcing and how the abruptness of the, of the transition uh, uh, the abruptness of the transition can be addressed too. So that's why it, it's, it's a fun link to make. Oh, okay. So, can multiple equilibria of the climate system play a role in Earth climate history? Uh, that's clearly not a, a new idea. Many people have thought about that before, obviously. Uh, there's uh, quite a long list of uh, papers which have thought about using that nonlinear properties of the climate system to uh, explain a variation of the past climates. Uh, a recurring problem when you try to do that is you have first to convince yourself that Earth, cis Earth's climate has multiple states, which is, which is not a trivial matter because we obviously don't have any record showing that the Earth's climate has multiple states. What we have are theoretical models or complex GCM to do that. So now if you look at simple models, analytical models, low order models, it's quite easy to build those models such that they have multiple states. It's, there's, again, a long literature of, about that and uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. If you look at GCMs, which is the next step on the complexity to, get, to build your confidence that multiple states could be relevant to Earth climate, it gets way more complicated because it's not easy to find them in a GCM. Uh, and Brian talked about that yesterday a bit. So when I, uh, just to, uh, to clarify, when I'm, I'm thinking about simple low-order model, I'm literally thinking about any models which have a couple of equations, like an energy balance model, which we have seen yesterday. Uh, GCM can take a very wide range of meaning here. So it can go from intermediate complexity, 
So typically, that could be models where the atmosphere is zonally averaged. So there, there are no eddies in that atmosphere. Uh, sometimes the ocean is zonally averaged. Sometimes there is one basin. Uh, they would still be called GCM because they have an ice sheet, they have a land vegetation, they have some information of the realistic uh, distribution of continents. And in that spectrum, it can go all the way to state-of-the-art IPCC class of models, which may have an idea resolving ocean and are extremely expensive to run. Okay, just a word about uh, uh, multiple equilibria which have been appearing in the literature, and that's, that's one which is important. Uh, it's the multiple state of the overturning circulation. So I'm assuming you know that there is an overturning circulation in the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, yeah. And there is not one in the Pacific. No, no, okay. A coffee, maybe. You, you need a coffee, guys. <laughs> no? Okay, so there is an overturning circulation in the Atlantic, uh, which is depicted through that figure. So it's just showing the stream function of the, the zonally averaged flow in the, in the basin. And to first order, we have warm, somewhat salty water coming in from the Southern Ocean being carried uh, all the way to the Nordic seas where they are transformed, so they are made more dense through loss of buoyancy at the surface. And some of that water is then uh, still modified through entrainment and uh, uh, density current along the topography and uh, exiting out of the basin at, at mid-depths, 2,000, 3,000 meters. And that's, that's coming from a, a, a data reanalysis product. So people have thought about the dynamics of that uh, uh, overturning circulation and the possibility that that circulation has multiple states. Oh, okay. Oh, that was weird. Uh, and one famous model is the, the Stomol model. You might have come across that. Uh, it essentially de de describes the overturning circulation as uh, the flow over in between two boxes. So there's a box in the low latitude uh, where you have evaporation and a box in the high latitude where you have net precipitation. And in between, there is a flow carrying TNS properties. And uh, the key in that model is that the flow between the boxes is proportional to the density difference between the boxes. So if it's dense here and light here, the flow will go one way and vice versa. Now, if you write just a budget for that, that model, you can see that the flow of, say, salinity is Q times S, and Q is itself a function of density, which is itself a function of salinity. So readily, you have a nonlinearity in the problem because you're going to get a S squared. And that's really all there is to get a nonlinearity in the system, and that allows for multiple states. Uh, so this is an hysteresis diagram for that type of model. So what it shows is the intensity of the circulation between the two boxes as a function of the freshwater forcing, which is at the top of the boxes. And what you get here is that you have multiple solutions. There is a range of freshwater forcing for which you have multiple possibility of the thermoaline line circulation. The one which we care about more at this point is that branch, so it's a high intensity overturning circulation, and there is a, a, a low intensity overturning circulation. And you know, that's, that's a diagram, that's not an exact solution of that uh, equation. But it's, it's a recurring uh, uh, pattern you, you, you'll find in those type of models. And so this one is a, it's what is called the on branch. So there is an overturning, and it's, it's not small. It, and it, uh, it's, it's transporting properties uh, efficiently between the two boxes. And of, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thermal mode, meaning that it's driven by the temperature difference between the two boxes. There is a second limit where the circulation is way weaker 
and driven by the salinity difference between the two boxes. And there's a range of parameters where these two properties can, can exist. So why this is interesting is that, especially to interpret DO events, people have used that type of multiple state a lot. Uh, it was first introduced by a broker uh, in the 90s, 80s, sorry. And, uh, but it, it, there is a very long literature of using this type of multiple state of the overturning circulation to interpret those uh, climate change. Uh, and, and you can readily see that uh, it's easy to produce abrupt changes. And the overturning is transporting heat, so it's changing the climate. So it has a number of tick, ticking boxes to, uh, to be very attractive to paleoclimate to explain what have been observed. Those type of multiple state are quite easily found in uh, coupled GCMs. So what people do, they call that water hosing experiment. Uh, essentially, it boils down to you take your model, there is an overturning circulation in that model, and you start to dump fresh water into the high latitude of the North Atlantic. So say you start your model, which has a uh, high intensity overturning circulation, let's say that 0.1, there's a freshwater forcing, and you artificially increase the freshwater forcing until the, the model drifts to the 0.2. And if you add even more, what's going to happen is that AMOC is going to collapse into an abrupt event, into a state where the AMOC is very weak. You can carry on maybe pushing your freshwater forcing further and then start to remove the freshwater forcing. But now you're on the lower branch, so you're going to move to 0.3 and carry on like that back to 0.1. It's very easy to, to do. And people have done that a lot in, uh, uh, in Copo GCM. So that's a plot from uh, an intercomparison project where many people have taken their numeric Copo GCM and they've carried out exactly this type of experiment. So they drive the system through a transition and back and forth, and they create those hysteresis diagram. And so many of those models have that type of, of uh, hysteresis of the overturning circulation. Uh, which obviously has reinforced the interest that people have for this type of model. I should say that all of the, a lot of those models of intermediate complexity, meaning that one or two of their components may be simplified, for example, having a zonally averaged atmosphere. So they are not high order. Well, they are, they are GCMs, but uh, uh, they are not state-of-the-art couple GCMs. If you go to couple GCM, it's actually getting harder and harder to get this type of diagram. So there is obviously a computational cost here. Maybe we don't find them because it's just too costly to, f to find them. But uh, people have put a lot of effort into understanding those diagrams, and as you get more and more complex models, they realize that there are other feedbacks than the ocean <laughs> in the climate system, which, you know, a posteriori sounds not like the, it's not a Nobel Prize discovery, right? Uh, but uh, they found that the ITCZ is responding, it's changing the freshwater flux uh, perturbation, which is imposed by the operator, so the user of the model, uh, uh, is against fighting against the feedbacks into the system. Uh, the balance into the Atlantic of the freshwater depends on how water coming from the southern hemisphere goes into the Atlantic basin. And again, it's very much dependent on uh, the currents and how they are resolved and the role of eddies. So it's getting really not trivial that those multiple states exist for more complex model than the uh, intermediate uh, complexity. There is another difficulty is that if you, if you read the numbers here, maybe it's too small, uh, the width of the heat hysteresis is 0.2 square drop. It's actually not a small number. Uh, in comparison to how much water would go into the North Atlantic in a real system uh, when, say, we have a deglaciation 
So obviously in the real system, the argument is that maybe an ice sheet is melting or sea ice is melting and it's freshening up the upper ocean, which drive the system across the hysteresis and back. But when we, we have estimates of how much water could come from an ice sheet, maybe from Scandinavia or Canada, the numbers are barely reaching 0.1 sphere drop. So we are right at the margin where this could happen, but it's not trivial that there's ever been enough fresh water dumped naturally into the system to, to drive those states. Anyway, it's still, it's still very popular and uh, you know, it has merits. I don't want to come across as saying it's, it's, it's an, an interesting. So another type, which Brian has described in detail yesterday, are multiple states which are driven by the CI albedo feedback. That, uh, uh, this is just a, a schematic taken from a, one of Brian's paper showing a summary of what is an energy balance model. You've seen that yesterday. But just to summarize, it's a model of the zonal mean temperature profile between the equator and the pole. And the ingredients are that there is short wave coming in at the top, long wave coming out uh, at the top of the atmosphere. And there is a transport laterally between the equator and the pole, which is proportional to the gradient of temperature. And the nonlinearity that makes it having multiple states is that the albedo, which is hidden in that short wave term, the albedo is a function of temperature. So when it's cold, we assume there is ice and the albedo is high. When it's warm, we assume that we have ocean, which has a low albedo. Uh, and that's the hysteresis diagram. Again, Brian has shown that and discussed that yesterday. Uh, for some range of parameters, you have two or three or four possible uh, equilibrium, uh, some of them stable, some unstable. So those states, they haven't been studied as much. And in fact, in the literature, there is, there is very little, very few examples of this type of, uh, of states. Uh, at least when we started, there were just a, a handful of studies that were really interested in that type of uh, uh, albedo, uh, sorry, multiple states. And uh, again, to be contrasted with this, people had carried out inter-comparison projects where 20, 30 people carried the same experiment. So I'm just citing a couple of examples here uh, in, in atmospheric only GCM. So maybe uh, some of you can reproduce that uh, during the, uh, the lab session. Uh, in this paper, they found multiple states of the sea ice cover. Uh, in an atmosphere only GCM. And uh, this paper looked at a warm state, which is like present day climate and a snowball. As pointed out yesterday, a snowball probably always exists. If you start a, uh, a model simulation with ice everywhere, it's white. There is no, nothing to pull the system out of the cold state, at least if you consider CO2 or other uh, uh, external parameters. So probably a warm state, a snowball always exists. So that's the one, the, sorry, that's the, the, the multiple state we are most interested in. Uh, this is probably just a repeat of what John said, but uh, how did we go after this type of multiple states? We used uh, idealized geometry uh, and went through a series of simulation with very simple geometry uh, of where we change the, the shape of the continents. I think John has uh, discussed that uh, at length uh, on Monday. All those states have different, uh, uh, all those simulations have different states and they are mostly driven by when we change the configuration of the continent, we change the ability of the ocean to carry heat to the poles. And so some have sea ice uh, at the poles, some don't. Just a word about the, the, the model we are using, because I'm trying to give you a sense of where we sit on that spectrum from intermediate models of, uh, models of intermediate complexity all the way to IPCC model. So we, we kind of sit in the middle in the sense that uh, we have an ocean atmosphere coupled model which has primitive equation in both atmosphere and ocean.
and is 3D, fully 3D, dyna 3D dynamics in both uh, fluids. Uh, in the atmosphere, it's, it has a coarse resolution, but it's, it's, it's enough to get some synoptic uh, eddies in the atmosphere. So th this is a snapshot of the temperature uh, at 500 millibar. Uh, obviously, in the ocean, because of the coarse resolution, there is not the ADs are not resolved, so we have to rely on AD parameterizations. And really what makes the model flexible and uh, uh, cheap enough to run for many thousands of years is that we are using the simplified atmospheric physics of uh, Franco Molteni. And this, the model is, is coupled, and there is the possibility of sea ice. So when we think about that uh, range of model where people have been finding multiple states, uh, we are above the one equation, clearly. We, we think that in terms of dynamics, we are above most of the intermediate complexity model. We are obviously not near, <laughs> anywhere near IPCC class model. And so there's still uh, lots of work to be done, but uh, uh, that's what we have now. Uh, just a movie. So that shows uh, 500 millibar temperature, uh, specific humidity, air sea fluxes, and mixed layer depths. It's in one of those aqua planets. Um, so again, the point is that we have idealized geometry, clearly, and th that's an issue. Uh, but the, the dynamics is, is complex in the sense that we can have a Rossby wave and uh, synoptic eddies going around. We have trade winds, uh, westerly winds, uh, and exchange of energy between ocean and atmosphere. You can see, uh, it's a bit tough to, care, to see, but uh, you have intense fluxes coming out of uh, the ocean in the, in the, in the cold sectors of uh, synoptic storms. And uh, mixed layer depth is responding by deepening so it's not a low order model. And Brian uh, showed that yesterday. Actually, he, he added a state in there, but uh, I'm going to stick to that, uh, that old figure here. So in two of those configurations, we have three possible equilibrium. Uh, so in, in the ridge world and the aqua planet, we have a state which, is, which we call warm state, which has very little sea ice. At the, at the two poles, there is a cold state which has big ice caps, and obviously there is a snowball. Well, I think any, again, any model would probably have a snowball. Um, if you compare, for example, the equator to pole difference in these two states, we have uh, one which is about 28 degrees C, so it's a uh, kind of like our climate now, and one which has a very large temperature gradient between the poles. So those states are, are, are stable, meaning that uh, we can run the model for thousands of years, and the system stays in that state. Uh, and they are run with the exact same parameters and exact same forcings. So they are really, truly multiple state of a complex dynamical system. So why do we have those states? Uh, it boils down to the, the shape of the ocean in transport. Again, it's a repeat of Brian's uh, uh, talk yesterday. The big point that uh, Brian made is uh, if you look at the shape of the ocean in transport as a function of latitude, it peaks around 20 north and 20 south. So if you compare to the atmospheric heat transport, which has a, an hemispheric scale, and peaks almost at 45 degrees north. The shape of the ocean in transport is very uh, asymmetric in a sense. Uh, it's large here and then collapses to almost zero as you go north of 50 north. It doesn't mean that that little leak of heat into the high latitude is not important, but if you care about the convergence of heat, which is how much that curve changes with latitude, it means that you're pushing lots of heat up to here, and then you stop pushing heat. And by conservation, it means that you are releasing a lot of heat in that area 
and you're releasing it to the atmosphere, at least to the surface, so atmosphere or sea ice. And that shape, it, we, we understand why there is that shape. It's not coming, uh, it's not coming out of the blue. Is that to first order, the wind driven, tr the transport in the ocean is wind driven. It's due to the fact that we have trade winds which are pushing heat, water at the surface away from the equator through Ekman dynamics. That's the first order. We have warm water at the equator. The trade winds are pushing to the right uh, in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere. So we are just pushing water out of the equator. And some of that water comes back after releasing its heat to the atmosphere in the western boundary current, Gulf Stream, Kuroshio. So essentially, it's an overturning circulation in the vertical plane, which is pushing warm water to the, to the north and cold water to the south. And it doesn't extend all the way to the pole. That's why we have that, that particular shape. So we can have in that system, we can have a, uh, uh, a steady state without any sea ice or very little. So little enough that it, it's not enough to trigger a sea ice albedo feedback. And you have to think that on top of that there is atmosphere, there is the atmosphere pushing heat to the pole. So even if there is a bit of sea ice and a bit of albedo feedback, there is still the possibility for these to be pushed back by heat transport in the atmosphere. Now, if the sea ice albedo feedback is strong enough that ice starts to grow on its own, just expanding because it's white and it's reflecting heat and uh, light and start to grow and make the system colder, it can reach a point where this albedo feedback is stopped by the heat being released from the ocean to the sea ice. So essentially, you can think of it as there's a big radiator here. Heat is released by the ocean and just stops the advance of the sea ice. If the system is able to go over that threshold, then the system will run all the way to snowball, except if, as mentioned yesterday by Brian, this part of the East transport is able to contract following the ice edge. But if it's not able to do that, once the ice has gone over that, that threshold, it will carry on and expand all the way to the equator. Why this is really important, the shape of the heat transport? Um, because that shape that we see in those uh, aqua planets is very much similar to the one that we see in observations. So this is the observed ocean heat transport, uh, estimated uh, from uh, uh, ocean reanalysis and direct measurements. So clearly, as you can see, the, 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 there are big error bars there. We don't know that, that ocean heat transport well. But it's pretty clear that even in observations, heat is pushed out of the tropics at about a rate of one or two petawatt on each side of the equator. So that big bulge is there in observation. And then as you move poleward of that 50, 40 degree of latitude, the heat transport goes to nearly zero. At least there's almost a factor of five or 10 between these two. So we, even in the ocean, in the present day climate, you have that very characteristic shape is present, which obviously gives us hope that in the real world, the mechanism we see in the other aqua planets could be happening. Uh, I'm going to skip that because uh, Brian has been discussing that. Uh, so now that we have those multiple states, we can think about how to make transitions between those states. So that's showing you a plot that's been done with the, the ridge world here. And it's, it's been very done very simply. Uh, you have two curves here, the, the red and the blue. So the red, that's the ice edge. It's 90 degrees. Ice edge means there is no sea ice. And uh, zero, well, 30 means uh, uh, there is ice down to 30 south, 30 degrees of latitude. So we have a, a blue cur or a, a red curve, which starts from an icy, ice-free state, and a, a blue curve, which starts from a, a state which has a big ice cap. And then we, we drive those systems by uh, simply uh, 
cranking up and down the solar constant. And really, we are not thinking about that as representative of Milankovitch forcing, right? It's just a way to get the, the system to transit between the states. The Milankovitch forcings are way more complicated than that. Uh, but we are just forcing the system to go over the threshold and collapse into the next potential well. So what you see here is that if you start from an icy, ice-free state and you, you drive it with a cooling, so decreasing the solar constant, the system starts to grow ice and then ice disappear again. You get an ice-free state for a few hundred years and then slowly the system goes into a cooling, a very slow cooling over a thousand year time scale flips around happily and then pops up back very abruptly to an ice-free state. It doesn't matter if you start from a, another point. If you start from a, an icy state, again, you get a warm tra a transition into a warm state, which is very fast. And you get this uh, interesting uh, blip where sea ice forms and then disappears before collapsing into an, ice, an icy state again. So, again, not saying that what we are looking at are DO events, but it's quite interesting to make the parallel between DO events. So I'm just plotting here the curve of the, uh, the Greenland uh, record for uh, Delta O18, which is kind of telling us that here it's warmer and here it's colder. But uh, it's interesting to see the... the, the the transitions between those states where going from cold to warm is abrupt and going from warm to cold is a bit more gradual. So you would compare this <coughs> to this type of curve. So perhaps we are looking at something which is relevant to the DO events, at least in their, in their dynamical aspects. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip this one, but because the the nudge here is to think about how the salt is changing in the system. So this is a plot of uh, uh, the salinity profile in the model as a function of latitude and depth for various years into the transition between ice-free, icy, and back to ice-free. And uh, this is indicating whether you have sea ice or not. That, that those purpley blocks there. So when we start in an ice-free state, what we have is the usual figure, the, the usual picture we, uh, we see in observations, for example. You get salty waters in the mid-latitude, and you get fresh waters in the high latitude. And that's just because it evaporates in the net in the subtropics, and in the net it's raining in the high latitude. There is not much to that. And if you're in a steady state, the ocean sea surface salinity is just reflecting the fresh water being dumped on the top of the, uh, the ocean. So now we start to cool the system. And what happens is that, obviously, as we cool, the temperature gets to the freezing point in the high latitude and sea ice start to grow. But sea ice is made of fresh water, so as it grows, it's leaving the salt behind into the, the ocean. So that we could that brine rejection. And what it does, it's making the surface water saltier and denser up to the point where the top of the ocean gets denser than the bottom of the ocean. So in the high latitude, a characteristic of the ocean stratification is that it's warm at depths and it's cold at the surface because obviously the surface is in contact with the sea ice and the column is stratified by salinity. So if you remove that salinity stratification by dumping a lot of salt at the top of the ocean, this triggers convection and this brings warm water to the surface and warms the, the ice, the ice. So the ice just melts away. So we are cooling, but sea ice has disappeared now, and we have deep convection top to bottom. And then from there, the whole system is going to cool down by cooling from top to bottom of the ocean. So there is a permanent uh, 
uh, convection from top to bottom, and the system is going to cool down up to the point where that whole water column is at the freezing point. So it takes a few hundred years to completely bring that whole water column to minus two degrees of the freezing point, and then sea ice will start to grow again. But, but at this point, there is, uh, uh, there is no stratification. The whole water column is at the same temperature and salinity. And as the sea ice progresses, in front of the sea ice, there is deep convection top to bottom, which is needed to remove the heat which is stored inside the ocean, and that's released by the convection. Uh, then after a while, the system starts to warm again. At the peak of the glaciation, so now the sun is turned up again, sea ice is melting, but when sea ice melts, it's releasing fresh water, so it's dumping light water at the top of the ocean, which doesn't trigger convection. So the, the melting process is not triggering any convection, and so the heat capacity of the melting process, of the melting phase, is only uh, uh, important for the top 100 meters. And the system is going to just melt away. So the, the key difference here, why, why are those time scales between warming and cooling very different, is that when you cool, you have to cool the whole depth of the ocean, so 3,000 meters. But when you warm, there is no convection, and the effective capacity of the ocean, which is in contact with the atmosphere, is only the, the depth of the mixed layer, so maybe 100 meters depth. So the time scale comes from that big difference in the stratification. That's why that's necessarily a slow process, and that's, that can be a very fast process. And that's probably something which is relevant to the DO events. Uh, just to finish the first hour, just to point out that, as I said earlier, uh, when it comes to DO events, people have been thinking about overturn by stability, multiple equilibrium state of the overturning circulation a lot as a framework to think about the DO events. Uh, there has been a few recent papers where the people have tried to push a, a shift in how to think about those events and thinking about the sea ice ocean interactions. Uh, so that's a paper by uh, Duncan et al. And I'm really just plotting the, the summary point here. And I'm not going to go through the details of that because they've used lots of paleo proxy to get through the, those, those, those ideas. But essentially, what they are uh, after is to point out that during st what they call stadial conditions is the bottom, the coldest phase of the DO event. Interstadial is the warm phase of the DO events. So in the cold phase, there was probably sea ice covering the whole of the subpolar gyre down to England. <coughs> While during interstadial, the warm phase, the sea ice was retreating, and really that's a schematic, but it was retreating maybe all the way to, to Greenland. What they are suggesting is that this oscillation has not a lot to do with the bistability of the overturning circulation, but it's, it's a coupled problem between ocean and sea ice cover. So from the paleo proxy, they could find, they could infer that in the cold state, there was actually still an overturning circulation going on, bringing warm water under the sea ice cover. And that heat, is being stored over under the sea ice cover up to the point where the water column becomes destabilized and start to overturn. And in that process, you are bringing the warm water to the surface and melt away the sea ice. And that's how you transition into this interstadial warm state where there is still an amok going. So in, in both situations, there is an amok transporting warm water from the tropics into the high latitude. The difference is that uh, whether that warm water is going under the sea ice or is, done, is going at the surface. 
no need to go a, a lot into the detail, but I'm just pointing out that there are some paleo proxy evidence that maybe the, the bi-stability AMOC framework that has been used to interpret the DO events is, is, is not necessarily the right one. And uh, uh, sea ice has to be uh, put a bit better into the picture. And that's just an example that uh, some models, that's a, a series of very interesting paper by Vittoretti and Peltier, where they have self-sustained DO events in a, in a model. So what they do is that they start with uh, a complex IPCC-like climate model, which exhibits self-sustained oscillations. Uh, so that's a very colorful figure that they've produced, but uh, uh, really the interesting bit here is that this is a curve showing the intensity of the AMOC. So in their case, the AMOC is going up and down in a natural way. They, they don't have any forcing in that, in that model. But the interesting bit is that uh, what's really happening is that the system is oscillating into a big ice cap, which is covering the whole of the North Atlantic, and a system where there is a huge polynia in the middle of the ice cap. And again, what happens is that the AMOC is transporting heat under the ice cap up to the point where that heat buildup is enough to destabilize the water column. And there is overturning and melting of the ice at the surface. Uh, and I'm going to stop there. We need a break, no? Yeah, yeah, even for that, you... 